Amen. Well, if you would turn in your Bibles to the gospel of, the gospel of. I've done that. I'm going to do that a lot more, so let's just get used to it. Genesis is good news, and that's what gospel means, so I'm not going to apologize for that. So just turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 3 through 23 this morning. We're going to focus on the fourth and fifth days. We saw on the second day how God created that expanse, which in the immediate definition just refers to our atmosphere, the sky, the clouds that we can see. The expanse can be and mean just that immediate atmosphere, sometimes just heaven above us. And it's really a vital, necessary component for life on the earth. You know, I'm sure some of you kids that study this, there are what, I think five levels of the atmosphere, the troposphere, the stratosphere. I know I'm getting them out of order, the exosphere. And we recognize and we know so much about the heavens, the expanse above us and how important it is. Without it, there would be no air. You know, for, for the vast majority of the existence of man on the earth, he didn't know that. He didn't know that that we have this thing called oxygen that's in the air that we breathe, that's only in our atmosphere, that's kept in because of our atmosphere, and that there's nitrogen and that there's carbon dioxide and the plants need that or there would be no life. Human beings didn't know that for thousands of years. And that the account of Moses would give an entire day to the air, no other mythology does that, the creation mythologies of, of, of other religions and and false they're all false religions other than the the bible none of them do that none of them would waste a time on the air they didn't even think about the air but moses writing before they knew anything scientifically but writing by the inspiration of god spends an entire day on one of the most important things for life because this is true this isn't mythology god really did create the expanse what an amazing creation that it is as we looked at it and how it protects us and how it enables life to be on the earth and we saw as we are trying desperately to hold on to what the bible says and not go by our understanding or what the world and what the scientists are saying that might contradict the bible but we're trying to believe what scripture says and it seemed like the bible was saying the bible seems to clearly say that there was water under the firmament and there was water above the firmament and we were hesitant to believe that and then we saw that the scientists are saying the same thing. That yes, there is actually hundreds of trillions of oceans of Earth's water above the firmament. And you know what? The only thing that keeps those waters from destroying the Earth right now is, right now, there's an expanse between those waters and us. There's an expanse, there's space between the 140 plus trillions Just in that one quasar of water, there's other water, water out by Saturn. The only thing that's keeping that water from us is God has stretched out space between the water and us, which is exactly what the Bible said. The only thing that I'm ashamed of is that I was hesitant to believe it until I saw it with my mind and with my senses. Why didn't I just believe it when God's word said it? Why did I need scientists to confirm? Oh, yeah, there is water in space. Let's just, let's try harder to just believe what the word of God says whether they've discovered anything to confirm it or not I think that's what the lesson of the second day is to me and we saw on the third day when God separates the land from the sea something that we know takes place by what's called plate tectonics there are plates on the earth on the crust is broken up into and they float on the mantle and the earth is the only planet that's known to have that and that's how the seas go deep because they they dig out chasms as they grind and go under one another what's called subduction and that's how mountains are formed as they crash into one another and one goes over top of another and we know all that and that's how we have a land planet not just a water planet because if it was all uniform the water would cover everything and God did all that on the third day half of the third day Something that if it was just natural processes, by the way, would have taken millions of years. God did it in half a day. He accelerated the creation. Let's remember that. God does the same thing with the plants. He creates all the plants on the second half of the third day. 
The second half of the third day, the foliage of plants, including herbs and fruit trees, trees with fruit and the seed in themselves, and those trees have to be mature at the end of that day, and they have to have fruit. Why? Because just a couple of days later, the animals are going to be here in mass, and they need to eat. So there's got to be fruit on the tree. And so God did that in an accelerated process. And, you know, it's, it's, it's neat to me because we've all seen those time-lapse films, right, where the plant just grows in like 30 seconds, and it's so cool. We can show that with time-lapse films. God couldn't make that happen in half a day, in six or eight or ten hours, whatever. All the trees grown very quickly. He caused them to come out of the earth. That's the way actually plants grow, exactly the way the Word of God says it. And so we begin to see the first creatures that that live, as it were, that need certain nutrients and so forth and how God organized that and made all of that. Now he's prepared the realm and now we're about to see the living creature come in to creation in the seas and in the air. God is about to create the living creature because he's prepared everything for it. It's all there. You see how orderly and good God is and that's what we're going to see in the text this morning. And I hope this morning... That as we see the living creature, we will see amazing evidence of God's goodness, God's care and compassion, and that we will see that the text is accurate and true, and that our faith would be strengthened. So let's pray as we turn to God's word. Father, I pray that you would bless the reading and the hearing and the practicing, not the practicing, but the preaching of this sermon. And that you would cause us to believe your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I always pray that prayer before I practice the sermon. It just comes out. I don't know. I'm in automatic mode this morning, so I better, better wake up and get out of it. Well, this is the word of the Lord. We're going to start in verse 3. Again, we're just going to focus on the fourth and fifth days, but I want to recall, beginning in verse 3, that God created light on the first day. So hear now the word of the Lord. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And it was evening, and it was morning, one day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and it was evening, and it was morning a second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and it was evening, and it was morning, a third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. He set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good and it was evening and it was morning a fourth day and God said let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens and God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas 
and let birds multiply on the earth. And it was evening, and it was morning, a fifth day. May the Lord establish this word in our hearts this morning. Well, I want you to notice, first of all, the fourth day. We're going to cover the fourth day here in the first point. Verse 14, God said, let there be lights in the expanse. Remember, that's what the word means. In the expanse of the heavens to divide the day from the night. God created light on the first day. We saw that. And God separated the darkness from the light on the first day. And God separated the day from the night on the first day. He did that by what I said was divine fiat. He spoke it. Fiat means to speak it, to be done. He spoke it, and it was done. He didn't say, let something happen so that this happens. He didn't have a secondary cause, a mediating creature. He just created the light himself, and there was light. Now God is going to use a creature by which that light will be perpetuated and maintained, but it was all in place from day one. We know that at first there was no creaturely source for light. We're going to come back to that. But that's taking the text as what it said. There was light. There wasn't anything that made light. God made the light, and there was light. In the second half of the verse, it says, let them be for signs, seasons, years, and days. I think it's interesting. The rabbis explain this text by saying that God had in view here his people Israel and that he was going to give them these seasons and times for their feasts and festivals. And the only way they know them is by where the sun and the moon are in the times of the year. That God had a view, obviously, to the end of all things. He knew exactly what he was doing. And part of the reason for the sun and the moon and the stars is that we would be able to know the seasons the time of the year that we could navigate on the seas by the stars, that animals would know when to mate and when to have their young and when to hibernate. All of those things God does by the heavens. They're for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. We would not be able to tell time at all without the sun. You couldn't tell a year. You couldn't tell a day. How would we be able to measure anything? How would we be able to live? Do you see how God has a mind to his creatures? It's not just to give light, but they're for signs. They're for seasons. They're for days. They're for years. Even for creatures to know. The salmon, when to go up those streams. And the grizzly bears to know when to go get them. And God did that. And it says that the purpose of them is... God put them in the firmament, in the expanse. Here's the second meaning of the expanse, which includes all of space as far as it goes, right? The words, Hebrew doesn't, it just doesn't have another word. The expanse is as far as it goes. The expanse can immediately mean our atmosphere, the sky, or it can mean as far as, as space goes. It's also the word heaven can mean the same thing, or the heavens. Usually it's in plural, both in Hebrew and Greek, but it can just mean what's above us, or it can mean... The sky, or as Paul says, the third heaven, it can mean where God dwells, which is beyond the physical, as it were, in the spiritual realm. And so God puts them in this place, space. And again, we notice the accuracy of Scripture, conforming to reality as we perceive it from the earth. Wow, this is exactly what it is. And God said about the lights that he made, so they're lights, and then he makes two great lights, verse 16, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Now, it's interesting to me, because some people try to find criticism here, well, you know, the moon isn't actually a light. Oh, wow, yeah, thanks for that one. The Bible doesn't say anything about what the source is, does it? We have uh, in television, you know, lighting is really important. You have to have strong light, you know, where the talent is going to be or what we call the talking heads. And so uh, the light director will come out and we have these light meters and he'll hold the light meter in front of, you know, where you want the camera to be pointing. But then he has to go to the back too because you need a back light to create dimension and that's really important on camera. And there's a different lighting level for the back as for the front and for the fill area. So he's walking around with this light meter and it tells him where greater light is and where lesser light is. And you know, if, if I would stand outside with that light meter right now and then if I did it again at night, the greater light would be now 
and the lesser light would be tonight. Exactly the way the Bible describes it. It's not trying to describe any kind of scientific principle about what and how light is made and anything like that. But everybody knows that in the daytime, the sun is the brightest thing in the sky, and in the nighttime, the moon is the brightest thing in the sky. How can you deny that? We still talk about the full moon, right? The quarter moon. And the light that comes from a bright night where the full moon is shining in all of its strength. This is the greater light and the lesser light. And about ruling the day and the night, that was just a way in which Hebrew said, what's, what's the strongest thing in the sky? The sun. What's the strongest thing in the sky at night? The moon. So it rules in the sense that it has the most strength. And so clearly scripture again is giving us something that is true. By the way, notice at the end of verse 16 where it says he made the stars also. He made is in italics in the New King James because it's not there. All it says is, and the stars, and the word the is part of the, the noun. So it's two words, the stars. Those amazing, right? I mean, we know the blue giants and the red dwarfs and these all we've been able to categorize, these giant stars. Many thousands of the earth would fit in one of them. They're so amazing. There's so many galaxies. There's so many stars out there. And the Bible gives two words to the creation of the stars. Do you know why? Because mankind has always had a tendency to worship the stars as if they're so important. In fact, in the, in the creation myths of other nations, the stars themselves are the gods and goddesses. And often the planets, because they didn't differentiate the planets when they would just use the word star. They knew that the planets were the planeto, the wandering ones. The planets move where the constellations don't. And that's why they worshipped especially the planets among the stars. And God gives two words to the stars. And he made them as an afterthought almost. They don't have any place in, in predicting man's life. You know, I know, you know, what nobody worships the stars now. Really? How come I get, you know, on my page, I can't get it to go away, my horoscope? Why is it on my page? I don't want it. Who believes that? You know, the early church fathers mocked that back in the early centuries of the church. The idea that the stars in the heavens somehow would predict your life or your abilities or the things that were going to happen to you because a certain constellation was in prominence when you were born. I've got, I've got, I don't know if it was Basil or whatever, and he talks about how some of the horoscopes of their day said, well, you know, if you're born under this sign, you have long hair. He said, how does that work for people in Ethiopia? Is no one in Ethiopia born in that month? Because they don't have long hair there. I mean, the, the funny things that the fathers used to just reject astrology. And you know, astrology was considered a science even into the Enlightenment. You can read stuff in the 1600s where respected scientists appeal to the astrologers. They still thought it was real at some level. And it was only because of the Christians continually mocking it, rejecting it, and showing how ridiculously stupid it is that it finally faded as, a, as an actual science that could actually do something. And yet still, billions of dollars a year are, are spent by very intelligent Western modern people on reading their horoscope. And the Bible gives two words to the stars because God created them and they are just creatures of his and they have nothing to do with your life as far as what kind of person you are or what's going to happen in your life. They're for light, God says. He made them to give light on the earth. The modern scientific movement came out of the Protestant Reformation. Why? Because they began to look at Scripture, not for myths, not for weird allegories, not for symbols, and what can I make this say, but what does it actually say for the good of man? It, it, it's just, if you read the like, early Middle Age commentaries compared to Calvin and the Reformers, it's so practical, it's so clear, it's so modern. They're looking for the meaning of the words and how that applies to man, not what can I make it say in some weird symbolic sense. Suddenly, it, things got concrete 
And that's exactly what started to happen in the scientific world. And suddenly astrology and alchemy and all these things that were actually thought to be sciences were seen to be, well, we're just sort of making stuff up here. What does the actual earth do when I put it in the test tube? That came out of the Protestant Reformation. And the early scientists like Pascal and Kepler and Newton were all Christians. And they were trying to think, as it were, God's thoughts after him. So secondly, I want you to notice the order of the fourth day. I want you to notice the order of the fourth day. The sun is crucial for life on the earth. Almost all the energy we get comes from the sun, or if it doesn't come from, you know, under the earth or in the earth. And the sun is created on the fourth day of the earth's existence, and I want to talk about this. Many of you know that I served on the credentials committee in um, Pittsburgh Presbytery. For six years, I was the chairman for at least four and a half years. And so we would examine all the candidates for ministry, all those who want to become ministers. And there are two of the most popular exceptions that ministerial candidates take in their exams, and that is some exception on the Sabbath, and the other one's on creation. And they say that they don't believe in six literal days as the Westminster divines talk about the space of six days in order to refute Augustine's um, well, they get it from Calvin, and Calvin quotes, Calvin says in the space of six days, in order to say Augustine was wrong, God didn't do it just in one day, and then drew it out to six days in order to accommodate himself to the cogitation of the angels. No, Calvin says, that's not what happened. God made it, he says, in the space of six days. And the Westminster divines quote that immediately, all right? Everyone knows they're referring to Calvin. By the way, Calvin says later on in his commentary that how silly the scientists think we are for believing the earth is only 6,000 years old. Calvin believed that space of six days was literal as all the divines did. Not a single written work by any divine ever, ever says anything else. But So we make it an exception. You have to take an exception if you're not going to believe six literal days. And it's usually approved as long as you know we sort of hedge off. They believe in a an actual atom that God created immediately and a universal flood and so forth, an actual fall. But when I ask the candidates who take an exception, well, why don't you, you know, why do you take an exception? Why don't you believe what the Bible seems to be saying on a, on a surface reading that God created the world in six little days? And the number one answer that I'll get from, these are college graduates, seminary graduates, right? They've done their internships. They are intelligent men, they are godly men, many of them. The number one answer is, well, God didn't create the sun till the fourth day, so it can't be literal. That's their answer. God didn't create the sun to the fourth day, so I can't understand chapter one as literal. Now, let me just think about that for a second, because a lot of times they'll point to, well, plants are created on the third day. Plants need sun. Sun doesn't get created till the fourth day. And I, I'm always bewildered by that, right? I, I just don't know what to do with that because if we take a literal view and God creates the plants on the third day, and by the way, we know it's the second half of the third day because the first half he was busy, you know, making the land and having the seas roll off the land and raising up the continents and shrinking down the seas. And I, you know, you got to give about half a day for that. The other half of the day is the plants. So by the end of the third day, we have full grown plants, right? And the sun doesn't come till the fourth day. And the thing is, if it's a literal day, we're talking about 12 hours of darkness, 18 hours for the first plants. You know, if we created them around noon, there's not a plant in the world that you can't put in a closet for 18 hours, take it out, put it in the sun, and it grows. The literal view isn't affected by this at all. You know what's affected by this? The view that many of them take. The day-age view. Because the day-age view says each day is, well, if you divide them up equally, 2.5 billion years. Now, how can you have 2.5 billion years of plants with no sun? You can't do it. And yet, the reason why they say that it's not literal is because the sun's created the day after. The day after... The plants. Oh, and by the way, let's not forget, there is light. 
God created light on day one, and there was day and night on day one, and there was darkness and night on day one, and on day two, and on day three. So there was light. There just wasn't a sun to dispense that light. And some people say they've got problems with that. Here's what Calvin says about that. Quote, God had created the light, but now he institutes a new order in nature that the sun should be the dispenser of diurnal night, diurnal daily light, and the moon and the stars should shine by night. Calvin doesn't see a problem with that. See, the thing is, if, if you take the day-age view, you have, to re, you have to rearrange the days. You have to do more than just extend yom. So much is talked about, well, yom can mean more than a day. Sure. But you're not going to just lengthen the days. Nobody's going to lengthen the days and say 2.5 billion years of plants and then, then the sun comes in. Nobody does that. You have to, re, you have to end up doing really a, a kind of um, um, a framework kind of view. You have to be able to do more than just say the days longer. That doesn't help. You've got to be able to say things are symbolic, things are pictures, um, because to just lengthen the day makes the text harder at this point, makes it more difficult. But God makes the light, and then three days later, he makes a creature by which that light will continue to be perpetuated and maintained. Is that not possible for God? Does that violate something? We know that light doesn't just exist in the vacuum today, but God is the one who made that the way it is, right? I mean, God makes the laws. God makes it so that fire gives light and heat. I assume God could have made darkness give light and heat. He could have made it so that, you know, any of the other laws or whatever they are, all of the laws that govern things, God creates. Creation has no characteristics. It has uh, no details that are, are part of it. It has nothing, no definition, till God brings it into existence and then gives it its, its characteristics. God makes that happen. The natural laws that we do know and understand are made by God out of nothing. It wouldn't, there, there are no, the creation creatures don't have a tendency to do something from randomness. God gave them what they have and made them the way they are. The sun burns with helium and hydrogen because God made those elements, burning elements. I, I assume he could have done that with argon and carbon or maybe created a whole new table of elements and done something else. He did it this way, but he did it. Why would we think that God's laws that he himself made, that he himself maintains, why would we think that they now bind and rule him where he couldn't do anything unless he would conform to the law that he's later going to make? Why would we assume that? And if that's the case, how can God make a dead body rise? Because that can't happen by natural powers. How can a virgin give birth? Because that can't happen by natural powers. How can a man walk on water? That's not possible. Unless we make up some kind of weird thing. Well, they were on the shore and it looked like he was on the water. And so we'll take away what the Bible says in order to explain it. Those things aren't possible in the natural. But you need to remember something. The natural is only the natural. The natural is only the natural because that's the way God did it. It wouldn't be the natural if he did something else. That something else would be the natural. It's no less miraculous because God has ordained and done something this way than the fact that God didn't. What God wants to do, God does. The laws that we see, we see that God made. He brought them into existence. We know creation is governed by them. But God made them that way. Let's, I, want, I want you to hear Calvin again. He gives a possible reason. Why did God wait till the fourth day to create the sun? And he says it like this. Quote, it did not happen from inconsideration or by accident that the light preceded the sun and the moon. To nothing are we more prone than to tie down the power of God to those instruments, the agency of which he employs... Therefore, because we're so prone to make, oh, God has to do it this way because this is what I see in the earth. 
Calvin says, therefore, the Lord, by the very order of creation, bears witness that he holds in his hand the light, which he is able to impart to us without a sun and a moon. So many, cre- so many nations worship the sun and the moon. And so creation shows God creating light without the sun and the moon. He didn't need the sun and he didn't need the moon. What did God do on the first day? Let me ask you this. Do you think God could create, I don't know, a match out of nothing? Do you think God could create a cosmic fingernail that would flick that match and it would ignite on the first day without a sun? Is that that too hard for him? Could he make a really big match, like a big one, and keep it burning for three days without a sun? Does God need, if God made a flashlight, here's a good question for you. If God made a flashlight, would he need to make batteries to make it work? I was looking for batteries yesterday and I couldn't make anything work without batteries. I don't think God's tied down to that. You know, if Romans 8, 28 is true, and if God really does cause all things to work for our good, to those who love God, then even the way he created benefits us. The way he reveals that he created benefits us because we are idol factories. We want to worship these heavenly bodies like the stars and Hebrew gives two words to the stars and then it shows us, no, you know the sun and the moon that so many worship and so many think so much of and that the whole earth depends on? I didn't need them. I made light without the sun and the moon for a couple of days and then I put them in the air so that you guys could understand and actually begin to recognize creation and, and, and understand what I've made and do all kind of great things with it but The fact of the matter is there's going to be a day when there's not going to be a sun and the moon again. You know that? Isaiah 60 prophesies about it, verse 19. The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will give you, the Lord will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. And Revelation 21 and 22 tells us that that comes true. Revelation 21, verse 23 says, And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God is its light. And the lamp is the lamp. You know, we examine, we look at the creaturely powers of the creatures that God gives us a mind to understand, and those creatures and their powers are entirely from God. And because we can understand them, we're not amazed at it. And we think that we, you know, we can know everything there is to know because we can understand the cause. And yet God is the one who made it that way, who did it that way. And that's the thing. There's so much, we looked at this last time, so much in in Big Bang cosmology that is true, that's accurate, that there was a creation, that it came from nothing. But it wasn't by nothing. It was by God. They leave God out. Why is the sun and the moon, and why does it do what it do? Where does it get its power? Why are things the way they are? Because God made it that way, and otherwise you have to say it's all just happening by chance, amazingly consistently, which is completely absurd, that by chance everything would be just as it was. Every moment, infinite possibilities, and yet it's always the same. No, God made it that way, beloved. And God's showing us in the creation of the sun and the moon on the fourth day. John Calvin says, quote, We acknowledge it is true in words that the first cause is self-sufficient. We say that. God is self-sufficient. And that, medi- and that intermediate and secondary causes have only what they borrow from this first cause. So Calvin says, yeah, we know. We know God made everything and anything else is a creature of God and it only can do what it does because God gave that. We all know that in our heads, but listen to what Calvin says we actually do. But in reality, we picture God to ourselves as poor or imperfect unless he is assisted by secondary causes. God really does need to make batteries to make his flashlight work. It's a violation of laws of nature if he doesn't do it that way. How can he make a flashlight shine without batteries? That's impossible. Can't make an axe head float either, can you? That's impossible. Beloved, it's no more amazing or difficult for God to make light without a sun than to make light by the sun. Then that the sun lives and, and it, not a living creature, but that it exists and that it has energy and that it does. Isn't that just as amazing? That it's there, that he made it. 
than if he just made light and there was no sun? How is one more amazing than the other? We need to start thinking this way, recognizing we live in a world that's made and sustained by the power of God. There's no other power ultimately. Yes, there are secondary causes. This little bottle holds water in. And they know how to make this so that it'll hold the water in there, right? If I tried to put this in a paper bag, eventually it would come through. It's made for this purpose. It holds the water nicely. We make it. But God gives it all the properties that it has and all the things that it does and the fact that we have the knowledge to do what we do. And so the fifth day, I want you to notice the fifth day. We've got to move quickly now because this is what I do. Slow down. Verse 20, then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of that firmament. Now, if you read the old commentaries, Calvin and the others, they, they do all this legwork to try to explain how it is that the birds came from the water. And that's because, again, really until later times, we didn't understand the Hebrew as well as we do today. And no rabbi would have made that mistake. But what happens is, if you follow the Greek and not the Hebrew, you end up translating the verse to be something like this. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and birds flying above the waters. Sounds like the birds came out of the water. So you read Calvin and Luther and others trying to justify why God would have made the birds come out of the water, like, you know, and the fish not. And they try to find reasons for that. But what they don't see, and this is a common feature of the Hebrew language that we know, is that there is a third person command that's called the jusive form. The first person command is the cohortative form. And the jusive form is used here, and literally, even as it says about the water, let, uh, let swarming things swarm. Same root. That's the way I would do it. Swarming things swarm. The New King James tries to do it, because abundance is a good translation too. Let, let them abound with an abundance. See, it's trying to keep the same root, abound with an abundance. Well, here it's let the birds bird, you know, or let the fowls fowl. It doesn't work. Let the flying things fly. You could kind of do that, but it's the same root. But it's let the, it's a command. You don't translate it as a participle and you hook it back onto the first let the, let the waters, you know, bring forth, doesn't say bring forth, but abound with the living creature, and the birds flying. No, it's a separate, it's the same structure exactly. Let the birds fly. The New King James, all modern translations get it right. Let, let the birds fly above. So they're not both coming from the water. So, you know, we can take care of that. But what I want you to notice is let the waters abound with an abundance. And if you look down in verse 21, so God created the, the great sea creature, every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded. Did you ever watch, I'm going to really date myself, did you ever watch those old Jacques Cousteau like shows? I, I was being a little kid and I don't know, it was like in the evening and he'd come on and, and it was this show for you younger people. It was this show about, you know, this underwater, I don't know, scientist, marine biologist, and they would do all of this um, uh, scuba diving, you know, and they would, the cameras would be, it was incredible graphics for back then and probably look horrible compared to what we're used to today. But all you saw, right, just so much life in the sea. Like all these different kind of fishes and, and plants. And then there was the, the corals, which are actually living. And then you had the starfish and the crabs. And you just saw this life, life, life. And then sometimes they get really small. And then you could see the tiny little shrimps or the plankton. or You know, there's just so much life in the sea. By the way, which doesn't make sense if evolution's true. Because natural selection is supposed to weed out, you know, the, the, the non-beneficial traits and to multiply the beneficial ones. Why all these forms? That's just crazy. You think it would come up with a good form that worked and just keep, you know, repeating that. To have all of these forms of life. I went on to the national, listen, the, um, the NOAA, the National Associ Oceanic Administration, Atmospheric Administration's website. And on a 2021 article, they estimate that there is right now in the oceans, at least, there's, it's their estimate, 91% of the ocean's creatures we haven't categorized yet. We've, ca in our, our modern time science, you know, wisdom dies with us. We're so advanced. We've got 9% covered of the ocean creatures. According to the NOAA 2021, the oceans really do abound with an abundance 
of living creatures, which just shows us the creativity, the variety, the beauty of our Heavenly Father who loves life and the living creature. And this great creature here, I was going to spend a little time on it. Maybe I just quickly created the great sea creatures, the tanim. It's translated in different places of the Bible, sea monster, whales, dragons, great serpent. It just means stretched out, really long. These are long, big creatures, right? And it's used in parallel passages with Leviathan, which we read about in our scripture reading, Job. And Leviathan is likened to behemoth. And so tanim, tanin in the singular, tanim might be like more of a general word. And underneath it, you know, might be, um, you know, types of tanim, behemoth, leviathan. Just like we have, you know, mammals and then types of mammals or, or cattle and types of cattle. And if that's the case, and if you read about, again, the great sea creatures, this is the first creature that it's said that God made. Notice it says God created. It doesn't say the earth brought forth like it does the plants, which is, by the way, how plants grow. They bring, they're brought forth from the earth. They come out of the earth, which says God must have created some fertile soil and so forth. I don't want to go into all that, but obviously. But God, no, it, it, the, the sea didn't bring forth living creatures. God created every, the great sea monster and every living thing. God created every living thing immediately. Nothing was brought out of the ocean. The primordial soup just made itself. God created the great. Why would it say this great, the tannin first? Every, again, mythical uh, account and all the ancient peoples have sea monsters and dragons. And there's all these legends of what look just like dinosaurs when you read their, when you see their drawings. And it's amazing that they all drew the same thing with these giant long necks and these giant long tails and these giant bodies, you know, um, and that's what we read about in Job, isn't it? The behemoth, tail like a cedar, trees like, or legs like trees, and when the river floods, he doesn't even worry about it. And where do these great dinosaurs live, according to our scientists? Well, they have to live in the marshes and in the rivers because they were too heavy to live anywhere else. And since the Hebrews didn't have a word for amphibians or creatures that can you know, dwell in the marshes, sea creatures is what they used to describe them. We saw that in the Job reading, that behemoth lives in the marshes and in the rivers. And Ezekiel 32 says this, too, using the word tanim, and it likens Pharaoh, I want you to hear this, to this sea monster. Son of man, take up a lamentation over Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, you compared yourself to a young lion of the nations, yet you are more like the tanim in the seas. And you burst forth in your river, and you muddy the waters with your feet, and you foul the rivers. The Tanim muddies water with its feet like some great giant Diplodocus or Brontosaurus. And it's not afraid of anything. It's a monster. And it's the first thing that's mentioned. And Job said it was the first of God's ways. Didn't it? Didn't we read that? First of God's ways, these great creatures. You know what I'm here to tell you, beloved? Once again, the scientists are right. Dinosaurs did exist before man a whole day. They're made on the fifth day. Man doesn't come around to the sixth day. We're in the age when the dinosaurs ruled. The Tanim, God made them. So fourthly and lastly, I want you to notice the goodness of God, the goodness of God. Well, Every day, good, it was good, it was good. But here I want you to see something. Something new happens in creation in verse 22. It's never happened before. As far as Scripture says, God speaks to his creation. He never did that before. Everything else was like a soliloquy. He said that things would happen. But now it actually says in verse 22, and God blessed them, saying... God's about to speak to a creature for the first time in history. And that first statement from God to his creation is what? A blessing in the form of a command. Because the law and the love of God are not separated. Because God loves his creatures, he commands them to do what is in their 
best interest to do, to do what he gives them the power to do, to do what is good, to be fruitful and to multiply. And all that that entails, and all of the joy and the delight of the animals in mating, just as humans have joy and delight in mating. God didn't have to make it that way. It could have been an arduous hard work that we got no pleasure from. But it's not. It's a wonderful thing. The animals delight it. There are many birds that mate for life just like human beings. And I think some of the sea creatures do. And they delight in obeying their Heavenly Father. God made it that way. And he blesses the creatures because he cares for them. And I'm not, not in some weird PETA, worship the animals because they're the same as humans way. But he does care for the creatures because they are living creatures. The first living creatures. The first time the Bible says the living soul, every living thing, living soul. Nefesh chaya. The same thing that he calls man. Nefesh chaya. And God, many times in Scripture, tells man to care for and to be kind to the creatures because this is what God does. Proverbs 12, 10, a righteous man regards the life of his beast. I always like that verse. Stu pointed it out to me one time. A righteous man regards the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Or how about Deuteronomy 22? If a bird's nest happens to be before you along the way in any tree or on the ground with Young ones or eggs, with the mother sitting on the young or the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. What? You shall not take the mother with the young, that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days. Wow. You could take one or the other, but not both. You you can't do that to animals. Leviticus 22, 27, when a bull or a sheep or a goat is born, it shall be seven days with its mother. And from the eighth day and thereafter, it shall be accepted as an offering made by fire to the Lord. Whether it's a cow or you, do not kill both her and her young on the same day. What is that but just humane kindness, respecting the life that God made? There's a creature there. Yes, I can use it for food. Yes, I can use it for sacrifice. God made it that way. But I need to do that respectfully. That's why Israel was never allowed to drink, eat the blood. Because if you eat the blood, the creature's still alive. That's the way a lion rips into a zebra. We don't do it that way. We humanely and painlessly kill that creature. And we drain out the blood. And we give thanks to God for it. And we eat it that way. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Another, again, just... God has concern for the animals. We see Jesus talk about this, Matthew 10, 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and yet not one of them falls to the ground? I used to sit out in my yard and try to shoot the birds with my BB gun. I ugh, regret that to this day, just trying to kill something God made for the fun of it. Not one of them falls to the ground, apart from your Father's will. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore you are worth more than many sparrows. You see, this is the lesson here. God cares for these creatures. He said, blessed be them. Bless them. Bless the creatures. When I was a kid, oh, I used to do this. You know, I told you the prayer that I prayed my mom taught us, you know. Dear Lord, hear me when I pray. Thank you for watching over me today. Now please watch over me tonight. Wake me with thy morning light. I would say that. And then I would say, you know, God bless mommy and daddy and nanny and pap pap. And, and then I would say, God bless all the good and kind people and all the good Christians. And then I would always say, and, and God bless all the animals. I would always say that. And I remember after I became a Christian and reformed, and I thought, boy, I shouldn't have done that. You know, you don't pray for the animals. And it wasn't too long ago that I thought, God blessed the animals once. Maybe it wasn't too wrong to say, God bless the animals. He actually did it once. He cares for them. Jesus said again in Matthew chapter 6, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And that's the point. We're in God's image, and God cares for the animals, and he blessed the animals. He takes care of the animals. How much more, beloved, does God know exactly where you are, exactly what you're going through? We were at a gala last night for the uh, Voices for the Unborn. Jay and Tiffany, remember I brought them in? And they had their big event last night. And they had a speaker, a a guy from, a minister, doctor from Harrisburg. And um, just, uh, I wish I could remember some of his credentials, but he's involved in education and all sorts of things. And he talked about how that when um, 
sperm is emitted. There are about an average of 370 million sperm cells in every emission, and it's only one that impregnates the egg. A lot of you think you've never won the lotto. You wouldn't be here if you didn't really, really win. There are no accidents. This whole gender dysphoria, trans, you know, God made a mistake. There are no accidents. You are here. You are exactly who you're supposed to be. God made it happen. Even the lilies of the field, Jesus says, are clothed by God himself. How much more does he clothe you, ye of little faith? The creation account should teach us of God's goodness, of how much, if he cares for the creatures, how much more does he care for and then he'll be with us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness and kindness, which we see in the creation, your wisdom, how you created in such a way that we would not want to worship the creature. We would want to give you all the honor and praise and glory and might. Oh, Lord God, help us to humble ourselves before you and to trust in you more, to recognize your goodness, to treasure the creation, to be thankful for it. All that we have and all that we know, you bring to us through what you've made, Lord God, and we thank you and we praise you. You, the God who made the heavens and the earth, the seas and all that is in them, we praise you, O oh God, how great is your name in all the earth. Help us to trust in you, who have created us once and, yea, even twice, having been born again in our Lord Jesus. What more could we want? We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name.